Great to have you back here on The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Now let's go to Off the Press where we have a quick review of the major stories making headlines across Nigeria today. I'm kicking off with the Punch newspapers just before we introduce our guest. It should be on your screen in a bit. And the big one there is talking about the loan request. Once again, it says National Assembly defends Buhari's $4.9 billion loan plan. APC, PDP clash over debt. All countries engage in deficit financing. We are still within borrowing limits, says the Senate. Buhari's loans for budget financing, not for looting, as done by PDP, says the ruling party. It also says here, APC borrowing to finance corrupt lifestyles of his leaders and their cronies, alleged the PDP. AGF writes, 36 governors, hints recovery of stamp duty arrears. And um, we can also see on the uh, punch this morning, bread, cereals and others push, push uh, food inflation to 20.30%. Nigeria piles up 2.36 trillion naira debt stock in three months. Also, uh, southern secessionists, not different from Boko Haram and ISWAP, says Bajabia Mila. Abiodun eyes federal government's 83.5 billion naira loan for Ogun Cargo Airport and others. Gunmen invade Lagos farmhouse, kidnap businessman, shoot passerby. And the lecturer sues Songwo Olu and CP over. A COVID-19 test demands 65 million naira damages. Other stories on the punch. Reps demand probe of customs killings in all your communities. And um, reconstruction of Otabe Okuta Road will cost 56 billion naira, says Fashola. That's all we can take on the punch this morning. Let's go to the Daily Independent newspaper. Yoruba Nation agitators bond with IPOP worries presidency. Bajabia Miller said, separationists leading nation to destruction, says reps to prioritize effort at firming security architecture. Above the headline on the Daily Independent, Uniben students kidnap VC, kidnapping quote, force her to rescind decision on school closure. Strike. Federal government, doctor's negotiation ends in deadlock. Passport seizure, ex-Rivers governor, Odili on EFCC watch list. Immigration tells court. Inflation records fifth decline in 2021 drops to 17.01% in August. Niger records um, 100 cholera cases, cholera deaths in four months. Minister says Nigeria would lift the ban on Twitter in a few days. PDP National Convention Southwest leaders make strong demand for chairman slot. Federal government okays 38.4 billion Naira road projects in Anambra, Binri, Bayelsa, others. Southeast National Assembly caucus to interface with federal government others over Namdikanu. All right, so now moving on from the uh, punch to, or the Daily Independent to the leadership newspapers. It says here, North, Southeast, I, presidential ticket, Southwest, six-party chairmanship. Consultations on zoning intensify. Uguayan committee begins uh, sitting today. It says new chairman can't assume office until seconders leaves or resigns. Also, strike. Federal government and uh, resident doctors agree to negotiate. COVID-19, Edo bars on vaccinated workers from offices. Uh, Okonjo Wella makes times uh, world's most uh, 100 most influential people. And also, Akwaibom, Inugu, Oshun sign anti-open grazing laws. Federal government to states, no stamp duty recoveries for five years. And also Nigeria's debt hits 35.5 trillion naira as APC defends borrowing. Um, let's now take a look at the um, Daily uh, Trust newspaper. Naira's free fall continues as Nigerians rush to hold dollars. One dollar sales at 565 naira. Citizens opt for foreign goods at all cost. Government officials, elites in rush for forex. Koi spent $55 billion um, dollars on foreign consultants and workers. 2023, North set to pick PDP ticket as Southwest leaders demand chairmanship. Nigeria's debt profile hits 35.4 trillion naira. Stamp duty, Malami writes 36 governors, says no recoveries. How fighter jets killed locals in Yubi State. Um, those are the stories we're looking at this morning.
Good morning uh, to our guest, Public Affairs Analyst, Mr. Ezekiel Iaitok. Yeah, good morning. Always a pleasure to be on Plus TV Africa. Morning to you, sir. I want us to begin with the top story on, you know, the Punch newspaper. And it's about the loan that President Muhammadu Buhari has written the Senate for. He wants to borrow $4.9 billion, and he says that's to fund our 2022 budget, and that's also to fund infrastructure projects across um, all local government areas of the state. Um, the National Assembly is defending the president, saying that um, the Senate is saying that all countries engage in borrowing and debt financing, and that we're still within our borrowing limits. Uh, but the PDP is saying that you know, this borrowing is just to fund the corrupt lifestyles of um, Nigeria's president and, you know, the, the leadership. What do you think? Uh, I am actually extremely worried, really, really concerned as, um, well, those of us that are, November 1, I'll be 58. So those of us on the higher side, um, we, we think of what our children are going to see in future, and it, it bothers me, you know, and it also bothers me that a lot of the people in government are people that are far older than myself, some are in their 70s, and it's as if these guys just don't care about the younger generation. It's like, let's make our name, let's do whatever we can do now so that we can make our name, notwithstanding... The, the prognosis, the higher implications of the actions. When you borrow, you borrow to repay. And I want to see the end game plan of this administration on repayment of our debt. And they keep talking about infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. To a very great extent, this makes sense. If the infrastructure is put with first, um, you know, emphasis on the people, in which case we're talking in terms of human capital development. I wish that my government was borrowing this amount of money to ensure that every single primary school child is introduced to ICT. Going into secondary school, they are well equipped for the future. And that every Nigerian student in every tertiary institution has a laptop, a personalized, specialized laptop where programming is made compulsory, whether you read religion, you read linguistics, you read history, you are an architect, you read medicine, it doesn't matter. You must understand programming because the Nigerian system has been able to look into the next four years, six years, 10 years, 15 years, and realize that ICT is the way of the future. And then the, 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 the president is no longer minister of petroleum, but minister of ICT, you know? Then we can see a thinking of the future of our children. But all this, though, we are borrowing to the infrastructure, rail program, whether it's going to Marabao, or it's going to wherever. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not okay. I'm, I'm not satisfied. So the explanation of, oh, we are still within the threshold is pedestrian. It doesn't make sense. And I think the time has come for us as Nigerians to wise up, to take our future in our hands, and to determine the leadership trajectory that we must take. The time has come when we must start to settle for cerebral governance. This political governance has given us that title of the poverty capital of the world. The time has come for the youth to wake up and decide what they want their future to be like. This is not about protest. Forget about protest. I'm not a, I'm not a fan of protest. It's a time for strategic thinking, to ask themselves, who is the next leader that we must have? Let's start from now and change the conversation. All right. Um, still on the uh, punch newspapers, uh, something pretty interesting on the top right corner. It says uh, from Wedebia uh, Miller, uh, Southern secessionist, not different from Boko Haram and ISWAP. Do you agree? I, I find that insulting. I find that infuriating. I find that, I would say, um, intellectually lazy. How can a man at that level make such a statement? It means they have no understanding whatsoever of the problem. He has no clue as to what is going on. Please, what is the Boko Haram statement? What are they looking for? My understanding is that the Southwest agitators, the Southeast agitators are saying 
Nigeria is not accommodating us on equal partner basis. If we cannot be equal partners, let us have no basis to be a nation. Let us go away. That is the bottom line. And then a man at the level of the Speaker of the House of Representatives of the Federal Republic of Nigeria says that that mentality is the same mentality as Boko Haram philosophy or ideology. I need to be schooled. He needs to come back and let me understand what Boko Haram is. Because my, my, my layman's understanding of Boko Haram to start with is that Western education is sin, is wrong, is bad. And then you equate that with a man who says, guys, if we are a country, let us be equal. And if we are, can, we cannot be equal, then let us have our way. My brother, you guys are in the media, maybe you know better, but please tell me that those two things are the same. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Well, um, how dangerous is a narrative like that? Um, you know, and how does this maybe also absolutely not help our... Infuriate. Absolutely preposterous. It's infuriating. It is disappointing. It is difficult for me to not believe that he's been quoted out of context. I believe that there must be a context that, that has been taken up because I know by Jabiel Miller, I know him one-on-one. -on -one. And I know he's cerebral. I know he thinks right. I don't know how that came about. But please, let him come to the public very early enough and put that record straight. That did not come from him. All right. mm. Okay, um, when we look through the papers, we see a story here, and that's about a, an alleged you know, attack by the Nigerian Army um, fighter jets on a community in Yobe State. And um, you know, on the Daily Trust, it says, how fighter jets killed locals in Yobe. And the picture there is very graphic. You can see people who have been injured. You can see people in a makeshift hospital lying on the floor with blood on their backs. And you can see doctors there carrying out, you know, um, minor surgeries on those on those persons. Mm -hmm. And when I took a closer look at uh, the story, we see that um, um, this actually happened in Yobe State. It's uh, in Unusari local government area of Yobe State, Buhari community. And uh, locals say that they were getting ready to go to the market on Wednesday morning when they suddenly heard the sound of a jet ahead, um, you know, above, and then it started to shell on the citizens, you know, firing at them. Uh, nine people died and so many other sustained injuries, you know, in that community. They're seeking treatment now, uh, medical attention at a government health facility in Gaidam. And, you know, they reached out to um, the Nigerian army. The acting spokesman of the Nigerian army um, said that they were yet to receive any report about that incident. And it's not the first time that we're hearing something like this, that, you know, there's a um, alleged bombardment of a community um, by army forces. Um, what's your commentary on this, um, Mr. Yaitok? Um, I don't know where to start with. First, my, my, my heart goes out to the civilians or the, all the people involved. That's number one. Number two is that sometimes there could be a malfunction on radar tracking device in the sense that maybe the coordinates were not put right. As a result, they went to a wrong target. The third is that the conspiracy theory is rife in the, in, you know, that there are fourth column or fifth columnists, you know, within the army, within the military generally, in which case they could do one or two things to just make people to go against the military. Those could be, those are conspiracy theories. But basically, my most disappointment is with the spokesperson who is telling me that something that heinous happens and they are yet to get intelligence. I refuse that statement completely. Within 10 minutes of such a thing happening, the military intelligence must have a red alert, a flag, okay? On, if they don't, then there's a major, major, major problem. Within 10 minutes, maximum of such, because there is a tracking, you know, it's not about one, one, one soldier walking along the street and, you know, and firing sporadically. Before any jet takes off, it's not something they do every day. There must be a very detailed operational dynamics that is set up 
Are you telling me that one pilot just got into the aircraft and you, like a fleet of cars, takes off, you don't know where he's going to, and then you're wondering where is this guy, where is not this guy? I expect that every, every, every aircraft that takes off is monitored and tracked at the highest level, and any mishap gets immediate intel, and then the, 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 the body, that the, the, the system or the, the, the organization gets what is going on. And this, this is something that happened God knows how long ago. On and Wednesday. they are yet to be briefed. I think it, it, it doesn't, doesn't uh, make the, the military look good. It doesn't at all. Mm. All right. Let's also talk about um, um, the economy. It's um, in the news that Nigeria's inflation records uh, fifth decline in 2021. It says it drops to 17.01% in August. Um, the reactions to, the, to this story have been you know, pretty different. Uh, most people are saying that, you know, you might, you know, put those figures out, but if it doesn't reflect in the lives of the average Nigerian, then, you know, it, it, it may not be true or factual. You know, we live in a country where we really don't appreciate the place of statistics. Statistics is very important, absolutely important. Mm -hmm. And it is within the context where you use statistics for planning. But when you use statistics for politics, it means that you are going to give me figures that are going to like um, rattle my brain because I can't seem to. By the time the inflation is, the figures are declining. First um, the session, the second one, the third one. It will be obvious that certain things are being done right, and those things reflect on the lives of the people. The average person should feel that yeah, things are getting better, but. I don't go to the market, I will, I will agree, but I have constant discussion with my family, with my wife, with my children, with the people I meet. And none of them is telling me that the price of goods are coming down. None of them is telling me that things are getting better. None of them is telling me that, oh, yeah, I can feel some good here and there. And yet the, the, the figures are telling me something else. I'm not a statistician, but something tells me that if things are getting better, it should reflect in the lives of the average man and the average man that i relate with on a daily basis they are not telling me that story so i don't know how to juxtapose those um their their, their figures mm, I, I think i think it's because it's the annual inflation comparing this year to last year but the month-to-month -month inflation you know has increased yeah. oh, well um but do, do you also think that you know nigerians are too anxious to see that difference because you know we're still talking double digit here um, would you know the effects become more obvious when we maybe get to single digit inflation figures? When a man is in a theatre, in ICU, you don't talk about anxiety. He's constantly anxious. So Nigerians are in the intensive intensive care unit. So we are constantly anxious. We just want something that tells us that oh we are improving. So we're asking the doctor, you know, what's going on. And then you want the doctor to come in and you tell him, oh, the numbness in my right hand has subsided. Okay, that's what you want to tell him. And the doctor says, oh, because of the medicine we gave you yesterday. That's what you want. You want to feel something and then tell the doctor, oh, I'm feeling better. And the headache has gone down. We want something. We want Nigerians to say, oh, we are feeling better. We are happier. Let the get Nigerians let the government borrow money to invest on human capital development. Mm. Let them borrow, let them just play down on infrastructure. Don't play down small. Let them just cool down. For instance, if that rail line to Maraba or whatever is not done, nobody will die. But if there's something that you bring about, you know, to, to improve the, the, the living standard of the man on the street by way of healthcare by way of housing, by way of education, I, I think Nigerians will feel better. And then successive governments can go more on, on the infrastructure. All right, Mr. Yechuk. Um, on, on the papers this morning, especially on the Daily Independence, there's a story here um, by Lai Mohammed saying that Nigeria would lift the ban on Twitter in a few days. Um, 
we've been talking about this for a while. The minister has been making promises back and forth that the Twitter ban will be lifted very soon. Um, he's been saying this. You know, he gave Twitter a list of terms and conditions. You have to register with the NCC, have a local office in Nigeria. But we keep seeing these promises. Well, but it seems that, you know, it seems to elude us. We've heard another one today, Nigeria to lift Twitter ban in a few days. How soon should we be expecting this? And do you see this as a possibility, really? You know, my friend, my friend told me that his father told him something, and I find it very instructive. He said, may the man who is always trusted never lie against you. Okay. May the man who is always trusted never lie against you. Okay? Very instructive. The reverse is the case. May the man who is never trusted not be put in a position to speak for the government. May the man who is never trusted never be put in a position to speak for the government. I, I, I think that uh, my, my, my brother, Mr. Lai Mohammed, needs to ask himself one question. Do Nigerians believe me when I talk? The jury is out there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, quickly also share your thoughts on the... Um anti-open grazing bills that have been signed in certain parts of the country, a choir bomb in Enugu and I think in Australian states. Uh, governors seem to be going ahead with their agreements for the 1st of September and um, you know, making whatever moves up necessary to protect their people. Let me, let me say this first. If you don't talk about Okonjo Iwela, it means I'm not going to Absolutely. stop until I say something uh, we're, about that. We're, we're, we're so wrapping let me up with Okonjo Iwela. <laughs> yeah, we're saving okay, the best for last. Coming to, I want to, yes, I want to salute the government of Akwaibom State uh, who have taken that bold step. I want to uh, salute the government of other states that have also done that. Uh, I believe that um, it's the right thing to do. I have said it before and I say it again. I believe that Sembisa Forest should not be a threat to us anymore. Let the government pull all the money they can from everywhere and invest in turning that, that nightmare of Nigerians into the future hope of Nigeria by investing and moving every cattle rare and giving them space they put instead of the art infrastructure. Because those who are Nigerians, I'm always careful to draw that line. The Nigerian headsmen, they have a right to life and living and they're doing business. And just as government supports some other businesses that are done, there was a time they gave grants to transporters and things like that. These headsmen, they are Nigerians, take some Bisa forest, pull down the whole system and structure and give them state-of-the-art facilities for them to raid their cattle there. Then let the states be able to manage their own resources and um, so that there are no longer all these clashes and um, uh, problems. So I, I welcome what the states are doing, and particularly my state. Uh, they've moved swiftly, and I, 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 I applaud them for that. All right. Go ahead and speak uh, now in celebration of Ngozi uh, oh. <laughs> You know, two things. First is that there is this agitation or this seeming cooperation between the, the Southwest agitators and the Southeast agitators, and people are worried. They should not be worried. The reason is that why I talked about this is that I went with Madame Okonjo Iweala to the World Bank to talk about um, housing for Nigeria. And one of the things that came up was the um, Land Use Act. When we got there, World Bank itself said, don't bother trying to change it, you will not. And Madam Okonjo Iwela was the one that led that uh, delegation. Instead, they said, walk around it. Walk around it. What's instructive is that if people will not allow restructuring to take place officially and formally, people are starting to walk around it. What you're starting to see is VAT comes out, and you're talking in terms of fiscal federalism. What you're looking at is that the Southwest agitators are starting to come with the Southeast agitators and they're starting to say, how can we come together and create a platform where we are equal partners? So instead of just allowing this fight to go on, why don't we sit down as a nation and look at the fundamentals of nationhood, of one of the pillars being justice, equity, fairness? Once we do that, then we would have 
you know, taking the wind off the sail of the agitators. This is just commonsensical, and it is also right and constitutional. Let there be fairness, equity. But on Madame Okonjo Iweala, I've worked very closely with her, and I continue to do that till today. And I find her somebody that has made us proud in more ways than one. She's a stickler for excellence. She sits on her job. She gets the job done. She is target-driven. She is fair-minded. And when she made me the chairman of the federal government 10,000 housing project, she, the minister was there. She said, if I want this project to succeed, I want to have the best there. And as far as housing is concerned, where is architect Nyaito? That guy has made us proud. I want him to anchor this. Unfortunately, it was at the tail end of their program and they had to leave. But why did she look for architect Nyaito? She said she wants the best in whatever she does. And that's where she is. She doesn't care whether you are from the north, south, east, or west. She just wants round holes in uh, round pegs in round holes, square holes in square pegs. And she has taken that to the world stage and has told the world that a Nigerian, she typifies the average Nigerian, that Nigerians are the best and they know what to do. Go to any country of the world, look at the top management of any organization. You'll find that the excellence factor there is a Nigerian. My prayer is that we will bring this excellence factor to bear in our country and read all these politicians and bring in cerebral governance, people that can turn Nigeria around. Nigeria can be a different story in less than four years, and that is a fact. Mm -hmm. On account of that, I want to hail my boss and really, really tell her that I'm so proud of her. Every Nigerian, every African, every woman in the world is proud of her. And... God bless her. Thank you very much, Mr. Ezekiel E.A. Toko. Appreciate your analysis anytime, any day. Have a great one. Thank you. Okay, we're now going back to history, and I'm looking at the year 1932. Uh, today, the September, um, the 16th of September, and it's when a prominent figure in India began a protest fast. And of course, um, I'm focusing here in Nigeria on something called National Identity Day. We'll be talking about that after this very short break. <laughs> 